We talked last time about the nearly 300 year period uh, when China was divided into the northern and southern dynasties. In the north, a series of states, most notably the Toba Wei, that were created by Turkic peoples uh, migrating into the area from Central Asia. In the south, a series of states, many of them centered at the modern day city of Nanjing, which preserved a distinctive Chinese culture uh, and indeed uh, went through an area of, of rather elaborate uh, flourishing of, of their Chineseness. By the latter part of the sixth century, this process of or this period of division um, had persisted long enough, but the conditions which had created it to begin with had begun to change. In the north, the uh, period of invasions, the period of migrations had ended, and a long era of of cultural accommodation had ensued. Uh, a, a blended Sino-Turkic elite had emerged, which had adopted Chinese ways in political administration, in, in many cultural practices, had adopted the use of the Chinese language. And North China ceased to be quite so alien uh, a, a terrain, quite so alien a space. In the South as well, while there had been uh, these very intense efforts to preserve a sense of, of Chinese purity, uh, the spread of Buddhism, the adaption of Buddhism to Chinese conditions, and simply, a, I suppose, a process of familiarization. The, the, the presence of, of, uh, of alien elements in the North was no longer so, so new, so disruptive. Um, created conditions in which perhaps there was a greater receptivity in the South even to the idea of, uh, of reunification with the North. And certainly, uh, the the ideal of a single integrated China uh, remained very powerful uh, in, uh, in Chinese elite thought, both North and South. In the 580s, uh, circumstances arose uh, and a, a series of events took place which brought to an end this long period of division and reestablished a unified Chinese empire for the first time in almost 300 years and which set the stage for the emergence of the second of the truly great dynasties in Chinese history, the Tang Dynasty, which would uh, ar arise at the beginning of the 7th century and flourish for nearly 300 years itself. What happens uh, in the 580s is that a general, a military leader named Yang Jin, uh, seizes power in 581 and proclaims a new dynasty. Now, Yang Jin was from one of these Sino-Turkic elite families in the north, in the northwest of China. Uh, he had been a military leader under uh, one of the several uh, small states in the north, under a, a particular state called the Northern Zhou Dynasty. Um, and he decided uh, at a certain point that uh, political conditions, circumstances were, were ripe for him to seize power himself. He displaced a, a, a young boy who had become the emperor of the northern Zhou, and he uh, seized power and established, proclaimed a new dynasty of his own, which he called the Sui dynasty. Sui was the name of his home district, and he then just gave that name to uh, the, the new state that he wanted to found. Now, there had certainly been many such political transitions uh, in the North and the South over the previous three centuries. Uh, but in this case, uh, Yang Jin was able to pursue by a combination of military and diplomatic and, I suppose, cultural means, uh, the goal of reunification uh, in a way which allowed him to succeed where others had, uh, had failed. He pursues this goal over the next eight years, uh, and by 589 uh, succeeds in reestablishing a single unified empire in both North and South China. And there were a number of aspects to uh, his success. Uh, in part, it's simply uh, a process of military conquest. He was a general, he seized power uh, using his armies, and he then led his armies uh, in a series of campaigns in North China against the other minor states uh, that were uh, uh, in existence at that time. And he conquers them uh, and absorbs them into his new Sui dynasty. 
Um, at the same time, he conceived the ideals of, uh, of, of conquering the South, or at least regaining the South for an integrated empire. He doesn't want to do that um, through military conquest. He would rather do that through other mechanisms. One way that he immediately begins to pursue this is that he sends his son, a man named Yang Guang, uh, to be viceroy of a city called Yangzhou. Now, Yangzhou was a very important uh, economic and political center uh, on, on the north side of the Yangtze River in East China. And it was part of the northern territories, but it was close to Nanjing, the, the center of, uh, of southern uh, political power. And Yang Guang was able from there to enter into uh, diplomatic correspondence and secret negotiations to try to bring about reconciliation between the North and the South. Yang Jin and Yang Guang both also used uh, Buddhism as a, a sort of cultural uh, uh, dynamic in their efforts to bring about um, reintegration, reunification of North and South. Uh, Buddhism, as we've said, had spread in the South. It had adapted itself more to Chinese culture. The, um, the distinctions, the divisions between the Buddhism of the Turkic peoples in the North and the, the spreading Buddhism in South China had, had uh, mellowed, had, had moderated over the centuries. And now uh, Yang Zhen and Yang Guang were able to use Buddhism as a common vocabulary, a sort of common uh, cultural repertoire that allowed them to reach out to the South, uh, ignoring or setting aside, in a sense, the elaborate literary culture of the South, which had been uh, developed in part to emphasize its distinction from the North, and instead appealing to the commonalities which Buddhism provided uh, for all Chinese at this time. And this was a successful strategy. Um, they managed to negotiate a marriage between Yang Guang and a princess of one of the southern states, uh, and that allowed uh, that territory to be brought under the control of the Yangs without military conflict. And by that point, the remaining southern states basically saw the writing on the wall. They realized that uh, uh, this was the, the, the direction in which events were moving, and they made their accommodations uh, of one type or another with uh, the new dynasty. So that by 589, all of China is brought into a single um, political uh, system, a single uh, a dynastic uh, structure. Now, Yang Guang, uh, Yang Zhen and Yang Guang then set about to fashion a new state which will be powerful enough and functional enough to retain this unity. Uh, what they don't want is to simply be another sort of passing phase of, of a brief unification which then will fall apart uh, in a generation or two. Um, now, there's an irony that enters into this because, in fact, the Sui dynasty only lasts uh, for a, a very brief period. Only Yang Zhen and then Yang Guang uh, are successful emperors under the Sui dynasty. And by the second decade of the 7th century, the Sui dynasty passes away and is succeeded by the Tang. So the Yangs don't um, succeed in establishing for themselves a dynasty which will last a long, long time. But they do succeed in establishing an institutional order, a new uh, political structure, a new system which will prove to be quite resilient and quite long-lasting under the Tang, uh, persisting all the way down to the beginning uh, of the 10th century. There are a number of key elements in this uh, system uh, that, uh, that uh, Yang Zhen and Yang Guang uh, put in place. One of them uh, has to do with formulating a legal code, giving a a body of law to the empire as a whole which will be used to regulate the affairs of government and to govern the activities of ordinary uh, uh, Chinese as well. Now, the adoption of a legal code is not a completely new 
uh, undertaking. Uh, certainly, if we go all the way back to the, the Qin state uh, in the 3rd century BCE, uh, uh, the legal code of the Qin was, was, very, was central to their rule, central to their administration. And the Han dynasty had had its own bodies of rules and regulations. But the law code promulgated by uh, Yang Zhen, uh, the Sui Code, uh, brings together laws uh, from north and south, from different uh, uh, administrations, different small dynastic states that had uh, uh, been in place around China, and seeks to create a body of law which takes into account the needs of various constituencies, various groupings within Chinese society. So the Sui legal code is, on the one hand, an effort to impose a coherent body of law on the empire as a whole, but it also is assembled in such a way that it, it draws in disparate elements and it, 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 um, it creates a unity, it, it solidifies a unity to the empire uh, as well. Another uh, important uh, uh, development uh, in, in Sui administration is the use of what is called the well field system. Uh, uh, the well, uh, the Chinese character for the word well, uh, you know, a, a water source, uh, looks a lot like uh, like a tic tac toe game. Okay, it's it's a, it's sort of a, of a of a grid, and the well field system was a. a a very ancient idea in China. Uh, it went back into early mythological times, and it was meant to be a representation of a very egalitarian pattern of land holding in the in the uh, in the in the well character, the character for a well. Uh, the outer uh, boxes uh, were private fields owned or or farmed by by peasant farmers. The central square uh, was meant to be a field that was farmed. Uh, for the Lord or for the for the empire, the revenues from the one square uh, would be used as as the taxes or tributes, and the other squares would be uh, uh, equally shared out uh, in the community. Well, there's not an effort to to literally reimpose uh, this exact system, but the wellfield system is meant to uh, to promote uh, a, a stable and viable agricultural order. And, and what it basically does is, while reminding us that all land in the empire theoretically belongs to the emperor, uh, the wellfield system is designed to, every three years, uh, redistribute land to ensure that farming families all have about the same access to agricultural resources. They don't necessarily have to have plots of land that are exactly the same size, but land is redistributed to prevent the accumulation of large amounts of land in the hands of some people and the falling out of other people from owning any land at all. In other words, you want to avoid uh, a landless peasantry, you want to avoid the creation of a class of farmers without land to farm. This would be, uh, uh, this would lead to social instability, it would lead to uh, unrest in the countryside, to rebellions, and this is not a desirable uh, situation. So the wellfield system was meant to regulate uh, the agricultural land market. Now that doesn't mean that all the land was distributed equally. Uh, there remain in the Sui and certainly in the Tang dynasty that follows the great landowning families, the aristocratic families which we talked about uh, arising and emerging during the Han dynasty and which have remained in place uh, throughout this period of division between north and south as the, the basic um, social uh, uh, organization uh, uh, of land ownership, of, of, uh, of life across the empire. These great families own large tracts of land, and the wellfield system doesn't mean that, uh, that that land is, is expropriated from them and then redistributed. It's not a radical land reform process. Uh, their land is basically exempt. They're, they're not on the radar screen for the wellfield system. But the wellfield system does serve to preserve a basic uh, uh, livelihood for, uh, for farming families, for ordinary sort of subsistence peasant farmers by redistributing land on a regular basis to ensure that everybody has enough to get by on. And it proves to be a very, a very viable, stabilizing mechanism for 
the next few centuries, uh, it, it breaks down eventually, and as we'll see late in the Tang, uh, the situation deteriorates quite dramatically. But for quite a while, this, this proves to be a, a, a good feature. Um, there were also innovations in terms of frontier defense. Uh, there was a recognition that the northwest frontier might continue to be a zone of instability, and in order to defend it, uh, Yang Zhen and Yang Guang come up with the idea of agricultural colonies. Rather than raising an army in central China and trying to send it off to fight on the frontier, they establish colonies of, uh, of uh, soldiers living out on the frontier, farming the land there, supporting themselves by their own resources, rather than having to be financed and, and fed from the heartland of China. And this proves, again, to be a, a reasonably effective uh, uh, policy. And finally, um, they establish a system of public granaries where uh, at harvest time every year, uh, surplus grain is bought up at subsidized prices on the market and stored in these public granaries. During the course of the year when agricultural prices rise, um, grain is then released into the market from the public granaries to maintain stable uh, supplies and to keep prices from rising too far. And this form of intervention in the agricultural economy, uh, which sort of echoes back to the activism of Emperor Wu in the Han, uh, also proves to be uh, a very functional, a very useful aspect of, of the Sui innovations. Well, um, Yang Zhen uh, is the first emperor of the Sui. He is succeeded uh, early in the 7th century by his son, Yang Guang, who continues many of the efforts of his father uh, to build a strong state. Um, Yang Guang uh, undertakes a number of military expeditions. He seeks to reestablish uh, Chinese control over some territories uh, on, the, on the periphery of the empire, which had previously been uh, parts of China, but during the, the divisions of the northern and southern period uh, had perhaps uh, gone their own way. Uh, in particular, he launches some military campaigns uh, against Korea. Uh, these are not successful, and, and indeed their failure uh, is part of what begins to create uh, dissatisfaction and unrest in, in the Sui. Uh, he also launches military campaigns uh, to the northwest, out into Central Asia, to try to push uh, some of the Turkic populations, in particular a group of people called the Uyghur Turks, away from the Chinese frontier. Uh, and these campaigns, too, uh, while they're more successful than the undertakings in Korea, uh, are a big drain on resources. Unlike the, the military colonies on the frontier, these, these uh, uh, campaigns of Yang Guang in Central Asia are financed from central resources and, and, uh, and, and disrupt uh, communities because soldiers are recruited and sent off uh, far away to, uh, to fight uh, uh, on the frontier. Uh, so those two tend to, to generate a certain amount of unrest. Uh, Yang Guang also undertakes some very important uh, kind of public works projects, in particular the construction of a great canal uh, from southeastern China uh, up to the northwest. Uh, eventually, the work that uh, he begins will become part of what comes to be the Grand Canal, which is the main economic artery from north to south China uh, in later history. Uh, but this uh, first phase is designed to help move grain from the, uh, the very wealthy grain-producing area of, of, uh, of the Jiangnan region uh, near the mouth of the Yangtze River where it flows out uh, to the sea. Uh, from that area up to the northwest. Uh, by this time, uh, uh, the capital of the Sui is, is up in the northwest, up near Chang'an and Luoyang. They have political centers at both of those, again, just as uh, earlier states have. But while these have been the political centers of China, of unified Chinese states, for a thousand years now, the Northwest has continuously through this period been going through a slow process of climate change which has involved it getting uh, warmer and drier and it has become less and less agriculturally productive. The Northwest uh, uh, had been, of course, as the original heartland of Chinese civilization. Uh, it had been a reasonably uh, 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 lush area, but it has dried out over the last 
thousand or two thousand or three thousand years and by the sway period the northwest is not able to support itself or not able to support the um, the lavish presence of the imperial court uh, as it had been in earlier periods and so the importation of grain from the southeast becomes uh, economically much more vital so the building of uh, the great canal uh, is uh, is undertaken by Yang Guang to deal with that problem. But again, this involves extensive mobilization of labor resources, the disruption of local communities, and while we can see it as a very necessary and very um, reasonable undertaking, uh, sort of in a, in a macro-historical view, for the people who were involved at the time, it became another factor in generating unrest and dissatisfaction with the Sui regime. The Sui dynasty comes to an end uh, in the year 617. And what happens is a, is a, a curious combination of, uh, of events, uh, a curious uh, set of, of causes leads to the transition from the Sui dynasty to the next dynasty, which is the Tang. On the one hand, there's disaffection, there's unrest, uh, unhappiness on the part of uh, elements in the population with the rule of the Sui dynasty. Uh, the military campaigns, the labor uh, uh, levies involved with the canal construction. Um, these things have, have alienated large chunks of the population, large, large uh, groups within uh, China. But it's not necessarily clear that, uh, that this would have in and of itself led to the overthrow of the dynasty. There were often circumstances in which um, uh, particular communities or, or even large sections of the Chinese population might have been unhappy with certain aspects of, an, of a particular imperial regime uh, that didn't lead to that dynasty being overthrown. Uh, instead, we can see an additional set of elements uh, in this case that are, that are a little bit unique and a little bit, um, well, curious and, and almost quirky. And these have to do with... Um, rumors and, uh, and, and mystical events uh, that begin to take place and to circulate around uh, the Sui capital uh, in the middle of the second decade of the seventh century. And these had to do with um, a, a story, uh, a vision, if you will, that uh, the imperial throne was going to be occupied by someone whose name was Li. Now, the name of the Sui emperors was Yang. So obviously the suggestion that the throne would be occupied by somebody named Li meant that the Yang family, the Yang rulers, were going to be overthrown. Uh, first, there were some uh, itinerant soothsayers who sort of spread this story around the capital. Uh, a short time after that, a popular song was circulating around, uh, which picked up on this rumor. Uh, picked up on this idea and, and became quite uh, uh, commonly heard. Well, Yang Guang was, was quite upset with this. He was very uh, concerned about this. He wanted to preserve his power, preserve his dynasty. And perhaps he made a miscalculation because what he did was he began to mistrust any of his officials whose name was Li. And indeed, he undertook to uh, murder several of them. He undertook to destroy individuals named Li who he thought might constitute a serious threat to his power. Well, not in the capital, but off in a, a city called Taiyuan, there was a military garrison, and the commander of that military garrison was a man named Li Yuan. Uh, he had the right surname. And he had a son named Li Shermin. Now, Li Shermin was a very ambitious young man. And he set out to persuade his father that he shouldn't wait for the emperor to turn against him. That he had this name, Li, that the rumors in the capital about someone of that name taking the throne were creating a politically dangerous situation, and that what Li Yuan should do was to seize the opportunity and to go to the capital and take power for himself. Okay? To, in other words, make this prophecy come true 
by taking advantage of this situation. And Li Yuan was reluctant to do this, and indeed not until it appears that he began to actually feel threatened himself did he finally accede to Li Sherman's admonitions. But he does. And in 617, uh, Li Yuan, uh, with Li Sherman's uh, uh, support and assistance, sets out uh, and marches south uh, to the capital to attack. Um, rebellions break out. The Sui dynasty collapses. The, the court collapses fairly quickly. Yang Guang dies. Uh, another uh, one of his sons is briefly uh, put on the throne, but this doesn't last uh, 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 more than a few weeks. And um, power uh, disintegrates at the capital, at Chang'an. This then gives rise to uh, a period, a brief period, relatively, of, uh, of civil war, where a number of uh, contenders emerge seeking to establish a new dynastic order. Uh, Li Shimin and Li Yuan uh, are, are sort of the, the leading contenders, uh, but it takes them about four years to defeat various rivals, uh, various challengers. It's not until 621 uh, that uh, uh, the last serious um, opponents are disposed of, and we can see the Tang Dynasty as uh, uh, finally sort of, sort of setting in. Now there's an interesting sidebar to this process which uh, involves uh, the Shaolin Monastery. The Shaolin Monastery is in Hunan province. It's not far from uh, uh, Chang'an and Luoyang and the sort of core areas of, of um, Chinese politics. Um, and the Shaolin Monastery had developed some uh, uh, particular forms of um, uh, of Buddhist uh, exercise, I suppose you might say, uh, which um, are the origins of a lot of the martial arts traditions that uh, we know uh, in, in later uh, Chinese and, and indeed East Asian history. Uh, and at the time when the Lees are seeking to gain power in China, Li Shermin has a very close relationship with the Shaolin Temple. Uh, the Li family has patronized the temple, made donations to the temple, and Li Shermin recruits fighting monks from the Shaolin Temple to serve in his sort of personal bodyguard and retinue. And these monks are involved in a number of uh, adventures, and, and the legends about them get uh, uh, expanded quite significantly. They became quite a uh, uh, a sort of uh, subject of popular mythology. Indeed, there are uh, even today there are films uh, made about this that, uh, uh, as part of the great uh, martial arts film industry in China. But the reality is that the Shaolin monks did indeed play a role uh, in the acquisition of power by the Li family, and this uh, this helped with the patronage of Buddhism that became characteristic of uh, the Tang Dynasty in its early. Uh, in the reigns of the first few emperors. Well, uh, in the 620s, the early 620s, uh, the Tang establishes itself. The Tang dynasty becomes uh, the, the, the ruling house of the, of, uh, of the empire. Uh, the name Tang, like the name Sui or the name Han before it, is a place name. It, it has to do with the, uh, uh, the origins of the Li family. Uh, and it is then given as, as the name for, uh, for their regime. Li Yuan uh, serves, reigns as the first emperor of the Tang uh, until the year 626, uh, at which point he abdicates. Uh, he lives on until 635 in a very pleasant retirement, but he turns the throne over in 626 to his son, Li Shermin, who in many ways really is the founder of the Tang dynasty. It's unlikely that Li Yuan would have rebelled, would have undertaken the conquest of power without uh, the urging of his son. So it's really very appropriate that Li Shermin uh, should come to be emperor of the Tang dynasty in his own right. And Li Shermin reigns for 23 years, from 626 uh, to 649. So he uh, presides over really the period of, of consolidation of power and the development of, uh, uh, of the core institutions and, and the, the stabilization uh, of the Tang dynasty. We will uh, pick up the story of how Li Shermin continues many of the policies of the Sui uh, 
uh, brings about some further institutional developments of his own, and really launches the Tang Dynasty on what will be one of the great ages of Chinese history, not only politically, uh, but culturally, economically, militarily. Uh, the Tang is a golden age looked back on by later Chinese and will trace some of the uh, achievements of Li Shimin and his successors uh, in the next lecture.